about catch technical and who are catch technical. So first of all, my name is Jill Mooney. I'm head of catch technical services. I've already met some of you before over the past few years. I used to head up an organization, um, sister organization to um, catch, which was YCF in Yorkshire, but now YCF and catch have merged. So moving on. So webinar etiquette. Um, you will turn your microphones off, which is brilliant. So we won't get any family incursions or office incursions. If you would like to turn your webcam off as well, um, then you won't show off up show up on the recording. Um, but it also saves our bandwidth. But there's only a few of us today, so it should be all right. Questions. If you'd like to pose a question, please post it into the chat um, area. And then Grind will take questions at the end. Um, or if you want to come off video at the end and you want to ask a question, feel free to do so. First then, a bit about CATCH. I'm sure you know who CATCH are. CATCH is a non-profit industry-led membership competency assurance and skills development organisation supporting the industry with the Humber regions, Yorkshire regions and beyond now. There are three distinct areas of CATCH, CATCH skills, CATCH membership and CATCH technical. So who are CATCH technical? Catch Technical are a specialist team of expert consultants brought together by Catch. Our consultants can work individually on a specific project or collaboratively to manage and deliver a complex program of work. We are supported by our partner, ESC Limited. So why might your business need Catch and Catch Technical? Change may be coming about because of COVID-19 climate change or steadily advancing and changing health and safety requirements post Brexit. Whether it's around regulatory compliance, supply chain operations, improving health and safety performance through workforce engagement or delivering advanced and highly technical projects on time, Catch Technical can help you. Catch Technical Consultants, a carefully selected team of technical specialists, providing special project support to businesses seeking to sustain and improve in these fast changing times. Our diverse team has over 250 years of demonstrated experience, delivering multi million pound projects in the energy, chemicals, personal care, and food industries. We offer bespoke advice, training, and solutions based on deep technical understanding, insightful analysis and industry knowledge. We pride ourselves in our attentive and collaborative approach, offering a whole project solution. Our clients, whether they be in Yorkshire, Humber or beyond, should be confident in our experience, consistent approach and trustworthiness. So that's just a few slides on Catch Technical. As I've said, my name is Jill Mooney. I'm head of Catch Technical Services. You can contact me on my email, jill.mooney at catchuk.org. Or if you want to have a bit more information about what Catch Technical can do for you, then have a look at the Catch web page, web, website and the Catch Technical web pages on that. I'd just like to do a little plug for our um, other summer blockbuster webinar that we've just released. It's a pre-record webinar and if you're interested it's an introduction to risk-based inspection and that's being presented by one of our other technical consultants Paul Sheriff. As I say it's pre-recorded so you can watch it whenever. And don't forget Catch Technical are offering 30 minutes of free telephone consultation as a follow-up to not just this webinar but any of our previous webinars we have delivered as well. Uh, you will be given a little, I will send out a little email this afternoon just saying thank you for attending today and also for you to give us any feedback and it'd be much appreciated if you could fill out that for me. Um, and so I'll now hand over to Geraint who's going to present targeting net zero in the Humber region. Hello, uh, can you all see my slide? Yes. Great. OK, so thanks, Jill. Uh, 
Yeah, my name's Geraint Evans. Uh, I'm one of the associates that works with Catch Technical. I also uh, uh, work for my own small consulting firm that I set up in uh, the start of 2019 after six years at the Energy Technologies Institute leading the bioenergy program. And I'll tell you more about that in a little while. Um, there was a comment, just a quest, quick question from Charlie that came up in the chat. Um, I've lost the chat now, but uh, engagement in the uh, hydrogen uh, in the region, you should contact Jill to speak with Katie Hedges uh, to find out more about the uh, outreach that Katie does in that kind of work, uh, Charlie. So um, I've, been, I've been working with um, in energy for over 30 years. I actually started my career with British Coal. Uh, I moved into the oil industry and I actually worked at uh, ConocoPhillips, now Phillips 66 down the road here. But more recently, I've been working in renewables, mainly biomass and bioenergy. But uh, since working with the ETI, I started working uh, with the energy system as well. And that's where this uh, work around targeting the industrial net zero in the Humber region came out of. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in the main uh, today. Um, so I'm going to tell you about this work we've been doing between CATCH and the Humber Lab. It's called the ISCF project. I'll tell you more about that, what that means uh, in a little while. Um, but it's going to involve a lot of change. So I wanted to in introduce that change by starting with the UK energy transition for the whole of the UK energy system. And that'll take us nicely into talking about the industrial energy transition that we need to do in the Humber region, driven by this ISCF project that we're doing. That will tell us that uh, we need to start thinking about new technologies, low carbon and carbon removal technologies. I'll take us through those available technologies and where they're appearing in what's called these Humber deployment projects. And finally, I'll tell you about where we're going with our cluster plan. Used to be called a roadmap, but now a cluster plan and where we are with that. And of course, I used to work in bioenergy, or still do work a lot in bioenergy and biomass. Just have to kill a call. There we go. Um, so you'll see dotted around some pictures I've taken in the past of biomass just because I can't get away from it and I want to keep pushing it a little bit. So first of all, something around the ISCF project. Um, and it comes out of four grand challenges that Bayes have set themselves. And within these four grand challenges are five missions. And the one we're really interested in here is the clean growth grand challenge. And it's the only one with two missions inside. And the, two, the mission we're interested in for this project is this second one to establish the world's first net zero carbon industrial cluster by 2040. And on the way to that, one low carbon cluster by 2030 to so show that there is progression. You know, we're not doing it all at the end. Actually, what low carbon uh, means needs to be defined. It's not uh, ready yet, um, but we'll work towards that as we're going. And there's more about that on the link below that you'll be able to look at if, if you want to look in more detail about where this is coming from. And by cluster, there are six uh, industrial clusters uh, dotted around the country. And this is what uh, we're looking to achieve net zero in. Humberside and South Wales are the largest clusters and Humberside by far the biggest. It's no surprise that uh, these two clusters have uh, oil refining and steel in them, the uh, really big emitters. Arguably, it's a big challenge for Humberside to meet uh, net zero, but perhaps it's also an opportunity to get economy of scale, to attack low hanging fruit, as it were, to get large cuts quickly. So it's probably an opportunity, I think, for Humberside to achieve something fairly big. And indeed, we're four times bigger than our nearest neighbour, Teesside, in terms of emissions. What's also not clearly defined in my mind is net zero at the moment. I find it easier to think of net zero in terms of the whole of the UK energy system. And so what we mean is that the total greenhouse gas emissions that we emit have to be matched by the emissions removed from the environment. And that's a really important point because you can't actually get to net zero without having some emissions removal. We won't be able to remove all of our anthropogenic emissions 
uh, that we emit, there will always be something coming out, whether that be from aviation or from industry, perhaps two of the hardest sectors to decarbonize. So the CCC and the Energy Technologies Institute really push that emissions removal technology piece. Uh, and you could do that through a technology called, technology called BEX, which is bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, or perhaps DAX, which is direct air capture uh, combined with CCS. What we're essentially doing is removing CO2 or capturing CO2 from the air and instead of releasing it back into the air we're putting it back underground storing it permanently. But as we think forwards into applying that to a region and in more detail again a sector within a region industry we need to think as we go forwards with our cluster plan or our roadmap how to consider the embedded carbon in the new constructions we will do. For example, we invest in CCS pipeline, we disturb the ground, there is an indirect effect. That's not clearly defined yet. And even more important, we could convert the whole of industry in the Humberside to burning hydrogen and just release water and Humberside would look really good. But if we made that hydrogen from natural gas in Teesside that was unabated, we'd actually make the situation worse. We'd have been better just carrying on using methane. So that needs to be thought of. And it's something we'll have to think of as we uh, approach our cluster plan straight from the off. Now, I've mentioned ISCF a few times. It actually means Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund. It's a fund coming out of Bayes, but it's managed by Innovate. And it's £170 million pounds that's going to be let. But as is normal with these kinds of grants or funds, they need to be matched by industry. So we have a total expectation of an investment of £431 million. It's, it's a huge amount of money, but we could spend all of that on one CCS project in Humberside. And actually, we ought to share some of that between clusters, I expect. So what it's going to do, it's going to accelerate our progress towards deep decarbonisation to uh, accelerate a cost effective future industrial energy system. And what we would need to see is that first net zero cluster by 2040 on the way to that, that low carbon cluster by 2030. And just to be clear, the scope of this project covers the energy intensive industries of which we have a lot in Humberside, so it's iron and steel, refining, chemicals, glass making, cement and so on. As an outcome, we'd expect to boost our region's competitiveness and drive inward investment. So you can imagine that if there is a uh, CO2 pipeline uh, going down Eastfield Road in front of the two oil refineries there, it would make low carbon fuels and chemicals coming out of those two refineries. And so hopefully increase the value of those refineries to their owners, uh, drive more investment in those and other um, industries coming into the region, perhaps uh, you could see some uh, um, more IT infrastructure coming in that's cooling heavy, needing low carbon energy. And so as a result, create and protect jobs in the region. But not only is that fund uh, split between regions or clusters, it's also split uh, down three strands. Uh, the first one is an academic strand around 25 million led by Harriet Watt and Dr. Uh, Professor Mercedes Moroto Vela. And their role mainly is to develop new knowledge and share, share it. By far the biggest strand is what's called a deployment project. And there's a few of those in the Humber region. You might have heard on the 1st of July that um, uh, uh, Equinor announced with PX that they want to convert or install blue hydrogen with CCS at the Sultan Chemicals Park. Um, the deployment projects are, are setting out to develop detailed designs leading to a demonstration of industrial scale technologies and infrastructures leading to deep decarbonisation of our cluster. The smallest strand is what we're talking about today, which is the cluster plan, formerly known as roadmaps. We need to work in parallel with our deployment projects and to understand the scale of ambition that we need to achieve. How big does the hydrogen system need to be? How big do the CO2 pipelines need to be uh, looking out towards 2040? 
So, so far in our Humber cluster, we have a Humber cluster plan. It was formerly known as Humber Industrial Deployment Roadmap. The uh, project has been split into two. It's a risk mitigation strategy uh, led by Innovate, uh, split into two phases. And phase one for us is now complete. Um, the idea of phase one was to develop our methodology and to submit a bid to allow us to complete our project. So it's like a starting point. And it means that, you know, Innovate can test how well we've done to make sure that when they looking at funding phase two competition, phase two projects where we actually deliver our competition, where we actually deliver our project, that, um, you know, we're a serious, serious player there. And inside of our phase one project, we asked Element Energy to look at uh, our baseline emissions data in the region. We firmly believe that the uh, Humber region is complex and we're going to have a complex set of data and we need to process numbers of buckets of data to deliver ourselves a clear plan. So a modeling led approach is going to be important. And we also looked at data sourcing and identification of data. And coming out of that, we um, prepared our bid and submitted it and hopefully uh, we submitted it on 22nd of July and that's now being reviewed by Innovate and if we're successful they will fund us to do our phase two competition to actually deliver our cluster plan and if we are successful we'll start work in January uh, for 27 months uh, completing in March 2023 and the overarching ambition is to identify that optimal route to achieving zero carbon in the Humber industrial sector. And by optimal, we mean the, the most secure, the low cost, low carbon route to achieving net zero by 2040. So it's going to involve a lot of change in our industrial energy system. And I thought I'd take us through what the ETI and indeed the CCC um, uh, industry uh, advisors to the UK government are looking at in terms of the en energy transition we need to do in the UK. And this Sankey diagram is essentially a map of the UK energy system. It's done every year by Bayes. This is the 2018 version. The units are million tons of oil equivalent. And on the left hand side, we have the energy produced in the UK and imported into the UK, the indigenous UK energy. And it's no surprise that it's dominated by fossil fuels, mainly petroleum and natural gas. Of course, smaller and smaller amounts of coal coming into our energy system nowadays. Petroleum, of course, um, goes into our oil refineries. It's converted very, very efficiently and mostly used in our transport system. Smaller amounts used in industry. And the second most important one is natural gas split almost equally into power and heat. Uh, power converted at around 50% in power stations in gas turbines, uh, making our electricity. And heat, a lot of that used domestically, around 90% of UK homes connect to the gas grid. Uh, we already, of course, use renewable energy, but the biggest source of renewable energy is still bioenergy. A lot of that used down the road at Drax, where they use around seven and a half million tons of pellets sourced internationally. Um, but it also includes energy from waste. Um, a lot of that uh, biomass used for power, some used domestically and some used as biofuels. On the right hand side, we have our um, total UK energy demand. Largest sectors are transport and domestic energy, domestic energy being electricity and gas, of course. Transport dominated by petroleum and then industry, which uses uh, electric and gas in the main, small amounts of petroleum products and renewables. Just at the top right there, you can see iron and steel. In terms of energy use, so big that it has its own little category here. Uh, and of course, only at two sites, one of the main ones being Scunthorpe and um, uh, South Wales, as I mentioned earlier. Now, to get to net zero, we're going to have to have major change. And I like this chart. Um, it's getting old now. Um, because it only shows the route to 80% reduction in the CO2 by 2050. And of course, in June 2019, 
we changed our target from 80% reduction to 100% reduction, net zero by 2050. But I think it's still useful to go through it um, because it shows the pattern of what's happening and what will happen. So up the left-hand side on the y-axis, we have our million tonnes of CO2 per year emitted by the UK, around 530 million tonnes a year in 2010. Useful number to remember for when I come to a slide later on. And across the bottom is time, initially in increments of five years, but later in 10 years. And at the right hand side, a little dotted line, it shows the target of 105 million tonnes a year of CO2 to be emitted by 2050, an 80% reduction target. So if we look at the blue, child, blue bars first, these represent power, and it shows us that we're decarbonised in power, more or less, by the 2030s. That's trailed by domestic heating in the yellow, uh, which is decarbonised in the 2040s. So that means we're going to be using very little gas. It means we're going to see a lot more electric heating, uh, decarbonised uh, district heating. And that's trailed by a um, transport and industry, transport in green, industry in grey. And these are the two most difficult uh, sectors to decarbonise. And we actually get to 2050 and we've actually overshot the target there. Um, but that's because in this scenario, we've invested in an emission removal technology called uh, BEX. And what's happening there is we are burning biomass and of course, when a, a plant grows, it, it uses photosynthesis to take CO2 out of the air and it turns it into the plant biomass. It could be wood, it could be some sort of other biomass like miscanthus. Well, with the BEX technology, what we're doing is we're burning that uh, plant material, but instead of re-releasing that CO2, we're capturing it and we're sequestering it underground, burying it from where it came from. And it gives us this credit. And what we call it's what we call a negative emission and we're balancing that off against the emissions from uh, industry and aviation and shipping in the main in this scenario and it's actually cheaper to do that than it is to uh, decarbonize aviation shipping and industry uh, and to allow those sectors in this scenario to carry on emitting uh, co2 from fossil fuels and that's the beauty of this model that uh, the ETI did. It's called the Energy Systems Modeling Environment, or ESMI. It's now owned by the Energy Systems Catapult. Um, it actually, the, the model allowed us to look at all the tools in the box and to work out the value of them because we didn't need to use all the tools in the box. We could drop CCS and see what the impact was on the cost of the future energy system. And actually, if we did drop CCS, it actually doubled the cost of the optimal energy system in 2050. But we could always meet the target. We could drop CCS, we could drop bio, we could drop wind, and we could see the impact. Now, I, I just noticed that earlier this month, this article in The Guardian, uh, National Grid saying that by 2033, the uh, National Grid could be uh, carbon negative and that's kind of reflective of this scenario here because those dark green bars underneath the line are actually biomass being turned into electricity combined with CCS so actually in 2040 by 2040 this model was telling us that we should be looking at a carbon negative power sector so huge change but if we now go to 2050 and a net zero it's an even bigger change. Now, what's happened here? This, this um, report on the left-hand side, Innovating to Net Zero, was prepared in March or released in March by the Energy Systems Catapult. It uses the same model as me, and it's extended that analysis I just told you about to achieving net zero. Now, the analysis uses two um, scenarios called clockwork and patchwork. And I've just noticed that the two charts are the same clockwork and clockwork. But um, do believe me that there's another um, scenario called patchwork. Clockwork is a more centralized scenario that they use and patchwork more decentralized. They're not two ends of, um, they're not two ends of, of a line, they're just two separate scenarios. 
Now, the really interesting thing that I heard when I went to see this report being launched in London, uh, on the, I think it was the 12th of March, just before shutdown, was that um, to using all the tools in the box that we could look at for meeting the 80% target, we could only get to 92% decarbonisation, not 100%. And actually, we're going to need to develop the tools that we had in the box. CCS that we use today can only capture cost effectively around 85 to 90 percent CO2. We would need to increase that capture efficiency up to around 99 percent using technologies that we kind of have, but they're lower in the TRL scale. They need development. They need accelerating. We would need to think about reducing our use of aviation, change our diet somewhat, and to introduce new technologies like DAX that we weren't thinking about when we had an 80% target. DAX is being developed in the US. It's about processing air to extract the CO2 from the air and to then capture that CO2 and pipe it underground. These te that technology is being demonstrated in the US, but it's a new technology to the UK and we might need to think about it. So indeed, to meet a 100% target, we're going to need more profound changes to meet that net zero. And instead of allowing ourselves to carry on using fossil fuels in industry and aviation, we're going to have to reduce our use almost to zero and think about using, uh, you know, we're going to be seeing a lot more use of electricity, a lot more use of hydrogen and district heating. Some fossil fuel will still be used in industry and aviation but we're going to need more use of negative emissions technologies to counter those residual emissions. And we're going to see a lot more use of intermittent power, so we're going to need more, more storage and more smart systems to help us balance the system. So a much greater change than we were at the needing with the 80% target. So focusing that more now into thinking about the industrial transition in the Humber region. I've said over and over that Humber, sorry, industry, uh, decarbonizing industry is a, a challenge. And there's five key reasons for that. And the first one and the main one is that the chemical feedstocks that we use themselves to make the products we want emit CO2. So for example, when we cal uh, use limestone, turn it into calcium oxide, we release CO2 that's sequestered inside that limestone. And when we refine petroleum products, we make fuel gas that we burn to raise steam to power the refinery. And so without great change, we're not going to be able to eliminate easily that CO2. So CCS becomes important. We're going to have to capture that CO2 and sequester it. And as I just hinted a moment ago, our processes are highly integrated. They make their own internal fuels from the chemical feedstocks. So that's in the steel industry and the refining industry. We need to do something about that. Our, our industry is already set up and, you know, they need high temperature heat. A lot of that is provided by gas. We could think about using electric furnaces. They are just about emerging. But that would need a lot of design change, takes a lot of time to rethink how we change our industries to use electric furnaces, for example. And that would be costly, need redesign retrofits. And we need to keep our industries competitive. We, we need to uh, decarbonize at, at a, using a route that um, creates and benefits jobs, for example. So as part of our phase one work, we asked Element Energy to um, take another look at the baseline uh, emissions from our uh, en industrial energy system here in the Humber. And they come uh, looked at the, the data that we could access, EU ETS uh, and Bayes emissions data, and they came up with a figure of 14.8 million tonnes of CO2 emitted each year in 2017. Now remember in 2010, at the chart I showed you a moment ago, uh, the total UK emissions is 530 million tonnes of CO2 in 2010. So it's quite a large percentage actually of the total UK emissions. And if I add power generation on Humber, 
in the Humber region into that mix, we get to just shy of 20 million tonnes. Interesting thing for me is that 72% of those emissions come from refining, first of all, and then steel. And refining, of course, in Birmingham and steel in Scunthorpe. Add, add to that our chemicals sector, that adds another 12%. Tells me that we have to address these three sectors if we're going to get anywhere near net zero in the Humber region. That tells me that certain specific technologies are really going to be needed, especially CCS, especially hydrogen. And we'll look at what people are doing in a moment. We also asked Element Energy to cast forward to think about, well, what if we do nothing? Are we going to get to net zero by just doing nothing? And they use some uh, Bayes forward uh, projections of uh, growth, which are a little bit uh, pessimistic, perhaps. But however you think about it, we're still going to have a large gap to meet. So something needs to be done. And those technologies that we're going to see, um, I want to go through them now. And of course, the first things we need to do is a bit like the waste hierarchy. You have to start first with demand reduction and energy efficiency. That can't take us all the way, but it's absolutely vital that we look to only use energy where we need to, and when we use that energy, to use it efficiently. But I've highlighted that the two most important technologies that we need to look at are CCS and its cousin CCU and hydrogen. Now, CCS is carbon capture and storage. It means that when we burn a carbon bearing fuel, it releases CO2. We separate that CO2 out, purify it, uh, pressurize it, turn it into a liquid, and then we can pipe it um, through a pipeline out and in the, hum re in the Humber region, we'd send it out to Easington and then out into a, um, a saline aquifer or an old oil and gas um, store. And there it would be stored permanently, sequestered and give us that deep decarbonisation that we need to seek, need to use. Its cousin is called CCU, carbon capture and utilisation. And in that sense, we think of CO2 as a resource and use it to make new plastics, to cure uh, cement or some other use. Thing is, when we're talking energy, it's huge volumes. CCU is in the chemicals field and the volumes there are much, much smaller. So CCU is a valuable tool, but it can't take us as far as we need to go as CCS. And indeed, we need to make sure with CCU that we're doing deep sequestration of carbon and not just re-releasing the carbon. It's important to think about that. Arguably, the Humber is uh, really well placed to take advantage of CCS. Just off uh, the coast here in the Southern North Sea, we have about 15,000 million tonnes of potential capacity in saline aquifers, gas fields and oil fields. That's around a thousand years of time, potentially gives us some time to think about how we're going to go forward and progress beyond CCS. Using a, CC, a, a, a carbon capture system uh, would be BECS and DAX, as I've mentioned earlier, and that's where we capture renewable CO2 or process air to capture the CO2 from the air and bury that air. It gives us those negative emissions that I uh, said are so vital to achieving net zero. Without negative emissions, we will not be able to use net zero as a CCC and ETI have told us. The other really vital technology I want to go through is hydrogen as a fuel or a feedstock. And this is where we replace a carbon bearing fuel such as natural gas with hydrogen. And of course, where we burn hydrogen, we only release water. But hydrogen is not um, available just to mine, we have to extract it. Uh, and there's various ways we can extract it. So we uh, define these under different colors, blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, brown hydrogen, and more recently turquoise hydrogen I've just heard about. So don't ask me about it, I'm still looking into it. Um, but a common theme with the ways we get hydrogen is we're just using chemistry to dive into a molecule and we're pulling the hydrogen out. So it might be we dive into natural gas, pull the hydrogen out and leave CO2 behind. Or 
we dive into biomass, same thing, pull the hydrogen out, leaves carbon and other elements behind. And with electrolysis, we're diving into the water molecule and pulling the hydrogen out, leaving behind oxygen. With natural gas, we already made, make hydrogen from natural gas, but we release the CO2 into the air, and this is called bright brown hydrogen. They already do this at um, Salt and Chemicals Park to make acetyls and acetic acid. But what we need to do, because our objective is to reduce carbon uh, emissions, we need to capture that CO2 and sequester it permanently underground. And then we can call it blue hydrogen. It's a low carbon hydrogen because CCS doesn't capture all the CO2. There is still an emission, uh, perhaps five to 10 percent of the CO2. So it's a it's a low carbon hydrogen. If I move across to the green hydrogen, um, there's various definitions of what green hydrogen means, but there's no international agreed definition yet. I've seen eight to 10 definitions, and most of them rely on the fact that the, the energy used is sustainable. So that means that if we made hydrogen from biomass that was produced sustainably, produced in the right place, in the right way, it would be called, it defines as green even without CCS. But if we made it from biomass with CCS, it would be a negative carbon hydrogen. And indeed, that's the way we make power from uh, BEX. We extract the hydrogen, burn the hydrogen, take the CO2 that's uh, released and capture it and sequester it. The most usual way people think of green hydrogen is to think about electrolysis of um, uh, water. So you take we, we take water, put it through a fuel cell, like a um, proton exchange membrane being developed by ITM in Sheffield, uh, release oxygen and take the hydrogen. Now, when we've made the hydrogen, hydrogen is hydrogen, and we can group it all together, whether it's blue, brown or green, and transport it to our end uses. It could be to fuel that train that's being tested, a fuel cell train or in a Hyundai fuel cell car. We can use it in industry as we're talking about today. Power, uh, many people are thinking of burning hydrogen in um, hydrogen fueled gas turbines, or we can export it as a product. So those are the two most important technologies. We can't forget biomass as a fuel or a feedstock. We can uh, use biomass to produce high temperature heat. It's already being used, of course. Uh, we can think of electrification, replacing, for example, steam turbine driven pumps with uh, electric motor drives or trace heating, steam driven trace heating with uh, electric trace heating. I was doing that 10 years ago when I was at uh, uh, Philips 66. Uh, or indeed use um, electrically uh, electric furnaces. And of course, in the future, there are other innovative pr processes that are coming down the line that we can think of, but mainly it's CCS and hydrogen. And you can see that everybody in the Humber that's thinking about these deployment initiatives and projects are using hydrogen and or CCS. I already med mentioned the H2H Salt End project announced on 1st of July by Equinor, where they're planning to convert the whole of the Salt End site to burning hydrogen. And they're going to make uh, blue hydrogen. So that means they need a CCS system and they're planning to build a P CCS pipeline from Saltand to Easington and then out to the endurance field. And they plan to save around just shy of a million tons of CO2 there. But they plan to extend that pipeline south to Immingham and then west towards Scunthorpe and finishing up at Drax Power Station. That's really important because it allows Humber Zero there at Immingham to tie in, to produce blue and green hydrogen for switching fuels at the refineries. And they plan to save uh, around 7 million tonnes of CO2. That's really important. You know, uh, we looked at that element energy work. Uh, the refineries are the biggest group, the biggest sector in our industrial sector here in Humberside. So we absolutely need to extend that pipeline south there. Now, Humber Zero are working with ITM Energy, that green hydrogen for the Humber project, bottom right, to develop electrolyzers for 
uh, installation at uh, Philips 66 uh, they're working with. That um, CCS pipeline goes out west towards Keedby and British Steel. Keedby want to connect their CC SSE, want to connect their uh, gas turbines uh, to the CCS network, as do British Steel, who are investigating some really interesting capture technologies that are more aligned with their process using limestone to capture CO2. They're also looking at hydrogen for fuel switching and uh, reduction in the furnaces. And then finally, the pipeline would get to Drax. And of course, there, Drax are burning biomass, gives us a huge negative emissions opportunity, nearly 16 million tons of CO2 that could potentially be captured at Drax. And they're also looking at hydrogen to take the last two units out of six into hydrogen, uh, perhaps blue, perhaps green. I don't, I don't know uh, at the moment, but it shows you the importance of CCS and hydrogen that people, uh, the importance people are placing on CCS and hydrogen in the region. So finally, I want to go into where we're going with the cluster plan. So if we're successful, we want to be identifying that optimal route to zero carbon Humber uh, by 2040. So we want to opt, uh, identify that low cost, secure, low carbon route. We want to understand the size of the CCS pipeline we need to put in, the size of the hydrogen. And in doing that, we're going to need to understand uncertainties to understand what those resilient technologies are, what the resilient choices are, and identify those potential futures for industry, working alongside the parallel deployment projects. Of course, we want to understand the value to the Humber, uh, and that's beyond 2040, because some of the returns will come beyond 2040, not just before. And that will tell us about the jobs we're going to create, the jobs we're going to protect, tell us uh, opportunity for in, inward investment. Catch is very interested in skills and training needs. We need to identify the gaps. We need to understand the pipeline of training we need to put in. And then of course the horizon will change as we go from January through to March 2023 and beyond. And so with the modeling we need, we want to put in place, we want to try and find people who will take that modeling beyond and run further scenarios that help us understand what happens when the horizon does change. So I said that industry is one of the most uh, hardest sectors to decarbonize, and arguably it's just got harder with the uh, impact of COVID that's about to play out. But it's really important that we maintain the momentum uh, here because climate change is a crucial issue that we need to work on. CCS and fuel switching, especially hydrogen, are going to be crucial technologies. But I mentioned earlier that even though the technologies are kind of here, we can deploy them right now. We need to continuously improve them. We can't just say we've installed CCS. That's great. We can carry on. We need to think about new technologies in terms of capture efficiencies and improve and get towards that 99% carbon capture efficiency. But arguably, even as the Humber region is the biggest region in terms of emissions, we're strongly placed to play a big role. There's, you know, if I can use a term, low hanging fruit, I think, an economy of scale that we can go for. So Catch and Humber Lap, we've put in our submission into Innovate UK to deliver our roadmap uh, to achieve, or cluster plan, sorry, it's called now, to achieve net zero in our industrial sector by 2040. And at the same time, we're working alongside large scale emitters like Equinor, like Drax, uh, ITM, uh, Unipa, Philips 66, and British Steel to demonstrate action at scale. Now, Jill said that, uh, you know, we can take questions and talk afterwards. You can uh, get me through Jill uh, or through the Catch UK technical services. I'm active on LinkedIn uh, and also my email address is there and phone number as well. There's finally a picture of Miss Scanthus there growing just north of Lincoln at Terra Vesta's site, um, just to put in another plug for biomass. Um, but I'm fully expecting, of course, that there'll be uh, questions now. So over uh, back to Jill 
uh, and I can take some questions. I can't see any questions at the moment uh, because I've only got a little window uh, for the teams. No, no, sir. sir. Thank you, Geraint. You're welcome. Would anybody, would anybody, anybody like, like to ask a question? I've seen, I can see a lot of questions well, uh, just, on the left yeah, now I after I, I um, put out. Uh, Latest proposal for hydrogen hump side can be found here. Equinox, yes. Interesting. Yes, the the point about um, net zero can only be achieved if you have some negative emissions, because you can imagine you need a combination of emissions reduction technologies and emissions removal technologies. You know, cows will still burp. Uh, we will still be using some. Uh, uh, um, fertilizer and fertilizer emits nitrous oxide if you over over treat um, farmers are looking at really accurate uh, ways of uh, metering um, fertilizer onto the ground but we will still have nitrous oxide coming out and we still have value for flying and some planes will still be flying in 2050 using aviation fuel kerosene um, so you need to have some way of taking CO2 out of the air. Long term effects of pumping liquid CO2 underground. Um, as, a, as a question people uh, ask many times, it's, it's difficult to say. Making any change has an impact. Doing nothing has an impact. What we do know is that we need to address climate change. And then without CCS, we are kiboshed. So, we have to go that way. Um, ETI was doing work on this uh, between 2007 and 2018. And actually one of the boat team at Boat Faces um, on the Sir David Attenborough is one, you know, there's many boat team at Boat Faces, different submersibles. One of them is a, a CO2 sniffing submarine that is autonomous and it, it will be able to um, go around the North Sea looking for leaks of CO2, for example, alongside static sniffing machines, if I can call them that. Now, uh, I'm not a geologist, so I can't take that question any further about the storage of CO2 underground. But we have to be aware that there is always a risk and that we need to mitigate and manage that risk in the same way as we need to mitigate and manage the risk of storing nuclear fuel. We need energy. We need to store CO2. Drax is burning wood. Could we use wood to replace oil in the chemical industry? Yes. Um, in the same way as you can dive into a lump of wood and pull the hydrogen out, you can pull out the carbon. It's a bit like Lego bricks. If you call a hydrogen molecule a red brick and a uh, a carbon molecule, a blue brick. You can put them together in many ways to make di many different molecules. You can make methane, you can make ethanol, uh, and you can make Fischer-Tropsch uh, liquids. We are already using that kind of fuel, Fischer-Tropsch diesel, in Shell Super Diesel. Um, when you buy it, it's got about five or ten percent Shell Super Diesel made in it, and it, that comes from natural gas. But you could make the same fuel. From, um, from biomass. And so by analogy, you can make acetyls, acetic acid from wood, should you wish. You can also use CO2, but CO2 is at the bottom of the energy chain. It's arguably below the line uh, and make chemicals from CO2 as well. So that's, that's from Duncan. There was a, there was a, a previous, previous question, question from Paul, Paul Heller. Heller. See that see one that going. Going. If you apply backs with CO2 pipe to coast, what is the economic case for extending the hydrogen? I, I can't really answer the economic case for that um, because I've not looked. Um, arguably, I would take natural gas and convert it on site to uh, make blue hydrogen or use water if there's sufficient water there uh, to make to do electrolysis because the pipeline is already there to use natural gas. So I suspect making hydrogen in the Humber and taking it to the 
uh, to Drax is less economic than just using the existing natural gas pipeline combined with a CCS pipeline that will be taken out there uh, to make hydrogen. I suspect it's a negative e economic case in that case. But I haven't done the sum. When these get, projects get developed, will they be encouraged to engage a local supply chain to support local jobs, maybe through CONCOM? Um, they would be sensible, um, but of course it's a national and international business, isn't it, Paul? Um, I can't answer that one. <laughs> it comes, it comes down, you know, you should be engaging now with Equinor and Drax and driving them. I think Catch do encourage people to use local supply chain because, of course, Catch Consultants is a local supply chain. Most of the consultants are local. Uh, we would keen to to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'll just, I'll just put the uh, 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 that question that from, from Catch point of view, and yes, we will be supporting the local supply chain. chain. I was wondering about replacing oil burning furnaces for generating steam. Steam is still a medium of choice for heating reactors. Yeah, this is this is a question about fuel switching. And um, potentially, of course, at cost, um, which could involve total replacement of an oil burning furnace. Uh, you could replace it with biomass or with um, hydrogen or indeed with electricity. Electricity furnaces are quite new, you know, but that comes back to, it's, it's an expensive thing to do. Um, and we need to keep our industries competitive and we don't want to offshore our industry either. We still need the product. We still need our acetyls. We still need our steel. Great if we can make it here and great if we can decarbonize how we make it here. So you have the potential of fuel switching uh, which is, you know, use hydrogen, or you have the potential of using CCS. Uh, so you carry on burning the oil, but you um, take the uh, CO2 that you've released on burning the oil and capture it. Now, remember, and it's something I didn't say earlier, that at the moment there's a 30%, if you, if you turn, if you, if you take a, a, a power station and add CCS to the back end, there's about a 30% power penalty. Uh, on that. So whenever you put CCS on the back end of a system, there's a power penalty to, to pay. It's not free in terms of energy. Yes, that's right. This would be a long term capital project for a chemical site. But, you know, climate change is a is a is a um, imminent danger. Um, and not only do we need to put it in the context of keeping the chemical site competitive? We have the balancing needs of addressing climate change. So it's something that's, that needs doing fast as well as protecting the site. I don't see any anything else. People can uh, put their cameras on and speak if you want, or, or just carry on using the chat. Yeah, please do. Is there any more questions or? Charlie. Yeah, yeah I'd, like, I'd like to ask a question if I may. Go on, go ahead. Uh, and that is whether anybody is looking at a sector deal for hydrogen. It's proved extremely effective for offshore wind. And somebody mentioned about the local jobs and the local benefits coming to the community. I think um, Grimsby and Hull have been extremely well served by the uh, the, the sector deal. Uh, is anything being mooted for hydrogen? Uh, I'm not aware of anything. Um, one of the, you know, all of those people looking at CCS that I showed um, are going ahead on the basis that the government needs to come up with something. I can, you know, answer that in terms of a sector deal almost for CCS because there's no business case for doing CCS right now. And CCS partners with hydrogen. I mentioned that with BEX uh, and, and with blue hydrogen, what you're doing is combining the making of hydrogen from biomass or natural gas, but you have to have the CCS with it. 
but you can't have the CCS if there's no business case for it. You know, you're not paid to put CCS down the line. So that something needs to come. And, and people like Equinor uh, and, and, and Humber Zero there are banking on the government coming up with some sort of deal. Um, and they're investing a lot of money. But the government is making some good noises. But unfortunately, in 2015, the government pulled out of a CCS deal. And so there's a lot of nervousness there. So it's a bit of move forward slowly, catch up, move forward slowly, I think. Um, I've not seen anything for hydrogen, but people are pushing. Uh, Paul has said something. The HOC Environment Audit Committee chair has been pressing the government for an overall UK hydrogen strategy, which he thinks is very much needed. I, I would agree. Uh, as part of our cluster plan, um, Katie Hedges will be setting up a hydrogen group led by catch in uh, in the humber uh, so if we get funded uh from january there'll be a hydrogen group building on the work that gisa rice did um a year or so ago now um and that was quite a well uh, gisa's group was very well attended actually at ergo um so i fully foresee a pressure group starting in humber on hydrogen Okay. Anybody else want to say, ask anything or make a comment? Now is your chance. Yes. Yep. Now's your chance to comment. <laughs> but please, please keep involved. Um, Katie is uh, runs the, uh, not only is she going to be running the hydrogen group, she has the Humber uh decarbonization group as well she runs through catch has been going running for about a year now last meeting was on half on zoom half face to face yeah because catch offices are now covid um secure and if you're a member of catch you can join the group and engage uh it's quite interesting because we're talking about the energy intensive industries here you know big companies who've already thought about this and a lot of the companies were sort of going and thinking, right, this will help us to understand our journey. You know, smaller companies that uh, we would hope to engage with through the cluster plan. So that if there's a CCS network in Immingham, hopefully smaller industries at Immingham Port uh, can seek to piggyback on what we're doing. And so accelerate the wider decarbonisation of Humber beyond what we're doing today. Katie is also running a subscribers list. So if you want to um, join up to that subscribers list, uh, let me know when I send out the feedback email this afternoon or tomorrow morning. Um, so if there's, if there's no more questions or comments, then um, I'll bring the webinar to a close and um, thank Geraint for delivering a great presentation again. I'm only a, an engineer and I can understand this presentation. So I think that's, I think it's set at a great level. Um, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'll speak to Not you later, Phil, as well. I'll, I'll give you a call. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us today. Hopefully the recording has worked today. It didn't work last time. Um, and I'll be uh, editing that and then posting that up onto the uh, Catch Technical web pages as well. So if you want to, um, have a listen again. The slides are already up there and then you can do it in your own time.